Hi folks, this is uh, Introduction to Abnormal Psychology and uh, we're talking about Obsessive Compulsive Disorder and this is part two, talking about some subtypes. And the next one is sexuality. This is a fear of committing an inappropriate act or doing something unacceptable like uh, sexually molesting someone, for example. And so they have discussed at their own, their own internal thoughts about sexuality. So thinking about sex in public that may be apparent to them or in church, for example, um, fearing having homosexual ideation and fearing that and so on. So those sorts of things. And then the, the, the precision and symmetry and exactness subtype. So this is somebody who, you know, everything has to be ordered in a certain way because not having it in a certain way is unacceptable. Something bad may happen if, it, if it's not orderly. Cars have to be pulled into the driveway exactly perfectly until it feels just right and is measurably. Even in severe cases, people will get out with a tape measure and measure the distance between this tire and the edge of the driveway and so on. That gets It gets really, really, really severe sometimes. Um, so, uh, you know, so, so the way this works is they may have a fear that not only something bad may happen, but they also fear that, 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 that not having it right will interfere with other things like uh, the inability to focus or concentrate. Okay, so it's not always clear what the obsession is. And then religious scrupulosity, um, thinking God is angry with you, these are the obsessions, upset with you, condemned because God's displeased with you, uh, those sorts of things. And so the obvious things that go with that would be uh, reciting prayers or reading the Bible endlessly and those sorts of things. And then the idiosyncratic or superstitious stuff. And that's believing that your own behavior will negatively affect yourself or other people. Okay? So, uh, you know, I treated someone named Kate once who thought if she made a mistake in writing something that her mother would suffer a heart attack. So she then had to, uh, to examine everything she wrote a hundred times to make sure there were no errors. And eventually she couldn't get to the place where she was writing anything. She was she completely uh, in, unable to function. Now, what are the childhood risks for this? Well, the temperamental risks are people who internalize their symptoms of anxiety. They focus very heavily on any normal symptom. This, this overlaps with somatoform disorders. High negative emotionality. Behavioral in inhibition. So children who won't step on the grass because they'll get dirt on their shoes, for example. It doesn't mean that that's a risk. It doesn't mean they're going to develop OCD. For environmental, physical, and sexual abuse, big stressful events, um, there is even a cause from having a streptococcal infection, which alters brain function in certain areas of the brain. And genetic, uh, first-degree first relatives are two to three times the rate. If the onset is childhood, the rate is 10 times. Um, so, you know, again, that may be an inheritance of anxiety in general and not simply specifically OCD. But in the case of OCD, since it is so particular a form of anxiety disorder, uh, anxiety-related disorder, um, then um, it may well be that there is some brain abnormality uh, that is inherited. Okay, so family studies do bear this out as being transmissible. We know that the concordance rate for identical twins is 57%. If one, uh, if one monozygotic twin has the disorder, 57% of the time the other monozygotic or identical twin has it. For fraternal twins, dizygotic twins, the rate is 22%, still way above the, the average population. Um, generally speaking, we think that there's an abnormal function in neural circuitry between the frontal lobe 
and the basal ganglia in the brain. Serotonin and dopamine seem to be the primary culprits. Um, so we think maybe low serotonin interferes with proper functioning between the uh, orbital region and the caudate nucleus, nuclei, I guess it would be. Well, where else do you see the eruption of OCD? Good question. Well, you can have a brain injury. Um, anoxia, exposure to carbon monoxide. Did you know that people who have a heater function that then distributes carbon monoxide in the living areas, uh, if there's enough of it, you will see an increased risk of those people developing OCD. Uh, viral encephalitis. Substance abuse can cause it. Hmm. And then this childhood uh, infection, streptococcal infection, called PANDAS, pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorders associated with streptococcal infections. There's enough evidence to suggest a risk there, but it is not totally tied down. How do we assess this? Clinical interview. Ask about anxiety in various forms. I just always routinely ask, no matter what, do you ever have enough anxiety that you do something over and over again to keep from feeling that anxiety? A very simple, not confrontative question to ask that can then lead, if they say yes, to other evaluation. You can use self-report instruments for this. You can use self, uh, stru the structure interview itself, the behavioral observations as you, as you look at them, sometimes, but usually not. You'll see something. Family reports, if you get a chance to do that. There are assessment tools like the Y-Box, which you can get online for free. There's no... Uh, a penalty for Xeroxing and using those. There are very forms of that, by the way, the Y-Box, Y-B-O-C-S, the Yale instruments that are, there are many forms of that. Okay, so um, you would know that because in the case of any disorder that causes a lot of time uh, to engage in anxiety reduction or um, reduction of symptoms in the short term, that Families are going to be impacted. Families are impacted if someone has a cleaning compulsion and they're in the shower for hours, if they've only had one, they only have one shower. So they get frustrated. There's the disruption of plans and togetherness. They, they worry. They blame themselves. They get resentful. All sorts of things can uh, happen to the family as a result of this disorder. So you want to educate the family. You want to talk to them. Yeah. In terms of medications, the most commonly used ones is are the uh, the SSRIs, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, um, Paxil, Zoloft, Lexapro, Prozac are ones that are used fairly routinely. They help when you get the dose right. Between 50 and 80 percent of patients, they get the they get the symptoms down or even absent in 50 to 80 percent of patients that's a good hit rate and then you want to look at you want to look at um, behavioral modification and the thing that's key to behavioral modification is to give that person eventually after looking at their uh, their illogical thinking their irrational thinking that's a cognitive part so what we're really talking about here is cognitive behavior therapy but the therapy part is exposure and the exposure has to do with going through the period of time of high anxiety following an intrusive thought like i just ran over somebody okay there's anxiety about that you have ways to talk to yourself to replace the irrational thought with more likely rational thoughts and then persisting through that high anxiety without going and checking and you what you find out is very quickly despite the high anxiety and using your own uh, methods to reduce the anxiety that are appropriate, relax, relaxation, deep breathing, that you would teach the client, that that anxiety goes down and goes away. And very quickly, in mild cases at least, all the way to moderate cases, 
this is very, very effective. Now, we want to just build up more slowly and have a medication on board before we uh, uh, really sort of can see massive improvements in the very, very difficult cases, particularly if they have poor insight or absent insight or are delusional. That, you know, the delusional part may or may not be affected by the, uh, by the uh, SSRIs. So, so we want this exposure and response prevention technique where they slowly learn to tolerate the anxiety associated with the obsession and then not doing the ritual behaviors. Okay. Um, so how long does it treat this? Well, you know what? Somewhere around three months. That's the average uh, using cognitive behavior therapy. Interesting. Okay, that's all OCD. We'll go to other stuff soon.